Hello, this is Emma and this video is Draw My Life I have so many stories to tell you some of them fun, some of them not so fun but all of them have contributed to the person I am today and that means I'm really grateful for every event no matter how difficult that may be for a while now, I feel like I've been living two lives, my Whispers Red life and my Emma home life. It's been really lovely to have the two separate because when I started this channel, it was nice to just be me and not someone's mum, someone's wife or all the other roles I played, just me. And you all saw me not having to fit in anywhere, not being a certain way to conform, just me with my soul and you with yours. I've been able to express myself in ways I never could anywhere else. Just be the true me. So thank you. I'm ready now and it's about time for those two lives to come together for me to show you all how much being around you guys has helped me. This channel and the kindness that comes out of every video has literally saved me, transformed my life and the lives of the people I love and care for. So many of you over the years have trusted me with your personal experiences and now I'd like to show my gratitude for you by trusting you with mine. So if this is something you'd like to share with me then make yourself a nice cup of tea and snuggle up cosy. Let's begin. I was born in the late 1970s in a small city called Lancaster, which is in the northwest of England. We lived near the sea. My mum and dad were very young when they married. She was 17 and he was 21, a nurse and a builder. It wasn't long after their marriage when they had me and I'm the first of three children. Life was lovely when I was little and I was cherished by my family and my grandparents. I'm from English, Irish and Scottish descent. We had very little money, just like everyone else around us in that time, but my dad is the hardest working person I've ever known. I'm quite a lot like him. We're close and I've always been able to go to him for advice and support. He's a really good man. He's very sensitive and, admittedly, he was stressed a lot when I was younger. He hasn't always made the right decisions, but right or wrong, he's always tried his best for me and I love him so much for that. By the time I started school, my sister was born. Life changed a lot then. She had celiac disorder, but it took a long time to find that out and up to then she just cried all the time. She was sick and in a lot of pain. It's well managed now and she's fine, but it was really difficult when she was a baby. I was very sensitive, surprise, surprise, and an empathic child and learnt very quickly to put myself aside and be a help to my mum. The new baby took up all of her time all of a sudden, but I'd always been very happy in my own company anyway being an only child for about four years. I was very quiet and well behaved, emotionally older than my years and loved playing tea parties in my Wendy house, making mud pies and colouring. Early school was fun, I had lots of friends, there were some really lovely tingly teachers but some mean ones too. 
One in particular would hit me when I used to use a pen with my left hand. She shouted all the time and once pulled me to the headmaster by my ear. I can still feel it now when I think about it. I used to fake illness a lot because she just terrified me. Thankfully, she left school and it was fun again. I especially remember playing marbles on the grids in the playground, learning to play the recorder and getting tingles at carpet time when the teacher read a story. At age eight, I developed Bell's palsy. Apparently it was from an ear infection. I woke up one morning and half of my face was completely paralysed. I wasn't too concerned for my looks at that age but it did make me stand out from everyone else and being sensitive that caused a lot of embarrassment. I had to explain it a lot and the unkind kids had a great time making fun of me. I already had the nickname Granny due to my short curly blonde hair which I hated. After several months of heat treatment and physiotherapy my nerves started responding again and I was able to smile fully. My face has been uneven ever since so if you notice my face twitching or my eyebrows are uneven in videos then that's the reason. I recovered pretty well considering. Around that time my brother was born. He was the loveliest baby and such a funny boy. He was sensitive and empathic just like me and I felt really protective over him. We had a lovely bond and we still do. Being eight years older than him he looked up to me and now I look up to him because <laughs> he's so tall. He's done a lot of interesting things in his life so far and now he's a doctor. Life with my dad was full of new beginnings. We moved house a lot. After finishing work, dad would come home and he would start work again on our house. Once it was done, we'd move to another beaten up old house and start all over again. Eventually, we arrived at a lovely place that he thought would be nicer to grow up in, and it really was. It was a small green village just outside the town. It was so great, and I could go out on my bike all day long, play in the fields, go to the park. Changing schools, though, was really, really difficult for me. Being the new kid, I got bullied a lot by a group of girls. The ringleader of the pack still gives me shivers every time I think about her, but don't worry, she grew up to be extremely boring and unattractive, as the spoiled kids so often do. Yay! <laughs> Once I'd been there a while though, I made really good friends and everyone lived nearby. Um, it was great to go for sleepovers, have dinner at other people's houses. I became an extra family member in a few households in that area. Food wasn't very nice at my house um, because my mum has never been much of a cook and dad was never in. The shopping ran out really fast and I just remember being hungry all. I had a favourite dinner in all of my friends' houses and became quite the people pleaser. I'd tidy up my friends' bedrooms and be extra polite so I was always invited back. My favourite things to do on sleepovers was to invent dances to pop songs and read the problem pages in girls' magazines. We used to sit underneath the duvet cover with a torch and just absolutely crease up with laughter. With both my parents working a lot, I got very used to taking care of my brother and sister. Our mum worked nights by that time, so I had to be quite inventive in keeping the other two quiet so she could sleep. 
When they were home, though, I preferred my own company, and if they went out, I'd sneak out my dad's old Beatles and Stones records. Growing up so close to Liverpool meant that the Beatles are in my blood. John Lennon was and is just like a family member to me, and his voice has always been a comfort. I love him. I also used to take myself to church on a Sunday morning. My friends and their families would be there, and I earned myself a spot in the choir, which meant I got two pounds for singing at weddings. This was amazing to me because I didn't get pocket money at home. In fact, once I got the taste for having my own money, I started working at age 13. First babysitting for different families around the area, then at the local dog kennels when owners went on their holidays, I used to take care of their dogs. And then after that, I started working behind the music counter of Woolworths, which I really, really loved. As I grew up, I increasingly felt the odd one out in my family. My dad was either at work or stressed about work. He left all of the emotional stuff to my mum. We had our moments of fun and connection, and she was there for me at a few key times, but as I grew older, she understood me less and less. I found myself trying to please her a lot and it never worked. I was very different from her so she struggled to understand my needs and wittingly or not she often sabotaged my confidence. There was always a separation and something missing. I'll never forget something she used to say to me which started when I was very little. I'd shout to her in sheer frustration you don't love me and she'd say I love you I just don't like you it kind of sums up our relationship really I'd firstly assume the issue was me being a child that's what you do but I was also smart enough to know that something was wrong I could never put my finger on it I was the one in the family brave enough to point out the truth when things were wrong, but when I did they called me selfish and ungrateful. I was the troublemaker in my family. I felt no one had my back, so by the time I reached high school and my teens I was really shy and I was really well behaved all on the outside, but on the inside, I was just confused and frustrated all the time. Then everything changed. Music happened. The high school offered musical instrument tuition, so I took up clarinet, and later I took up tenor saxophone, and I was really good at it. Suddenly, I was valued for having a talent, and it gave me an identity. After school rehearsals, orchestra, the county jazz band, local shows and festivals, wherever they would let me play, I was there. I always wanted to be a girly girl, um, but I was given short hair all of my life, short back and sides every time. I was so embarrassed and I couldn't speak to people without going bright red, especially to boys, so I finally took control and refused another haircut. It seemed to take forever to grow, but I was now speaking through my instruments, I had a way to express myself and it gave me confidence to be tough. Eventually, seeing I had a talent for it, my dad bought me my own instruments and it must have cost him a fortune and he never had that much money, so I understood the value of that. They were really big and heavy and I carried them on the bus every day. If I'd been to an after-school rehearsal, uh, the bus home had already gone, so I would carry them 
with all of my other stuff, gym stuff and books and everything, two and a half miles along the coast to home. I didn't mind it because every now and then I'd set myself goalposts and I would take a few bench stops to sit and I would sit and watch the sea for a while and think about what my future was going to be and where I would be in 10 years time and come up with ideas and tell myself that everything was going to be okay. Sometimes my dad would see me on his way back from work and I'd catch a lift. It was one of the only times that we really talked and I, I loved it. He would give me loads of advice and tell me I could do anything I wanted to do in my life and tell me stories about his life too. Finally, once my hair grew long and it was the biggest, bushiest hair you've ever seen and a sort of reddy brown colour by now, I was in the sixth form wearing Doc Martens, which I customised myself. I painted silver stars all over them. I was dressed like Janis Joplin and knew all the words to every Smith song ever written. <laughs> Music was everything to me. I loved Jimi Hendrix, Nirvana, The Stone Roses, The Cure, The Charlatans, you name it. Whatever I could get my hands on, I was just obsessed and I would read biographies about all of the um, musicians and songwriters. And it was about that time that I was sneaking out at night to meet the older university students in Lancaster and I was going out to all of the indie clubs. I even made my way to the Hacienda Club in Manchester one night without anyone knowing. A friend at school one day said she thought I looked like Tori Amos, so I looked her up, I didn't know who she was then, and from that moment I was absolutely hooked. After a bout of different hair colours, black, purple, blonde, I dyed it bright red like hers and I've been doing that ever since. That's the colour you see now, she was my idol. And I still love her. Soon I hooked myself a guitar playing boyfriend and we started a band. My voice wasn't very strong but I was determined to be the lead singer so I just shouted until eventually the notes started to form and I became quite good. We got to support Jules Holland when he came to town a couple of times and had lots of fabulous band disagreements, which we even got into the local paper for. We won a Battle of the Bands competition and got to play to a crowd of 800 people in France. We thought we were really cool. <laughs> as well as all of that, I was earning money as a wedding singer Plus my Woolworths job and going out socialising, I really didn't have the time for school and exams. I hated school by this point, I hated the system and the system hated me. Teachers would get frustrated with me because they knew I was wasting my intelligence but they went about it all the wrong way and they told me I'd never be successful at music and I was wasting my time. It just turned me off completely, so much so that when the A-level exams came, I wrote poems on most of the exam papers. Oh, gosh. When it was time for the exam results, I knew what was coming, so I packed a bag and I got on a plane and escaped to Paris. My friend was working there as an au pair and she offered me a bed. I had the most amazing time. I spent my days sitting on the steps of the Sacre Coeur, listening to Rage Against the Machine on my Walkman, deciding what my next move was going to be. I just knew that I'd ruined my chances of getting into uni, but I was desperate to leave my family and the town I grew up in. 
At that time, I just thought that I'd turn mad or boring if I stayed there and I just had to leave. So I decided to put an advert in the national music paper, The Melody Maker, for Singer Available and joined a band in Nottingham, which is in the Midlands. The drummer agreed to put me up on a camp bed in his house and that was that. I'll never forget the day I moved out. My parents drove me there. All I had to my name was £250 savings, a ton of CDs, a guitar, a clarinet, saxophone and a bag full of charity shop clothes. My mum was there, crying, doing her usual poor me, you're upsetting me routine and my dad was disappointed and scared but proud of his crazy, messed up, brave daughter and trying to comfort his wife. And then there was me, absolutely terrified, but pretending to be in control so that my dad would stop worrying. I had no idea what I was doing and I cried myself to sleep that night in a cold, damp, uncarpeted room on a creaky old camp bed. It was awful. Eventually, the boyfriend I'd left behind decided to move away too, and after a short time, we both moved to London. This was a new boyfriend who had been in one of the other local bands. We were great friends, and he was an amazingly talented musician and songwriter. He was the moody, tortured artist type. We were tragically poor, but managed to rent a cheap place together. It was above a Jamaican barber shop and near falling to bits. If you went into the bathroom at the right time in the morning, you could see the landlord cleaning his teeth through a hole in the floor. We didn't mind so much being poor. We'd take numerous trips to the supermarket to buy the maximum daily allowance of nine pence beans and cheap loaves of bread and just lived off beans on toast. I joined an all-girl rock group and he had his own band. It was really tough trying to make it in music, but we both had tons of fun. We'd support each other in our gigs all over London and had some really great experiences. I remember once he supported Coldplay at a gig in Camden. They hadn't signed a record deal yet and that night they had all of the a r people from the record companies coming to see them. The venue was packed and they, when they came on, my boyfriend and his band were being really moody by the bar. So I went to the stage to see them all on my own. It was the most amazing atmosphere and such a great, great night. That night, I also met a BBC Radio 1 DJ. His name is Steve Lamack and... He gave me his home address to send him my songs. I didn't do it, I was way too scared. There were so many opportunities that came my way at that time, but I was always too scared to do anything about them. Being behind a microphone on stage or in the studio, I felt like I could conquer the world, but all the other stuff just terrified me. A big US label wanted me to send material over, but I didn't. Björk's manager was interested in taking me on, but I was again too scared to pursue it. I just wasn't cut out for the music business. Me and the girl group, we did appear on a Channel 5 TV show once, but thank goodness it's not online. I think my dad has a copy of it somewhere, but I could never bear to watch it. Mine and the boyfriend's relationship was coming to an end. We outgrew each other and found life. I found life with him quite depressing. I was excited for a new start, so I left the girl band. And my best friend from high school was in London too. She'd been to uni there and we decided to move to Brighton together, which is on the south coast. However, when it came to organise our move, she was nowhere to be found and none of her friends would answer their phone to me. 
As it turned out, she was moving in with my ex-boyfriend and they both just disappeared from my life. I was alone again, with no money, no home, no friends, apart from one who was a sort of a friend of a friend, a lap dancer who was in between acting jobs. She's really funny actually. She'd been left behind as well and was in the same circumstance, so we found somewhere to live. Me and my two cats, Sydney and Lily, and all the other stuff moved. The new place was just as much of a wreck, if not more. The windows didn't fit the frames, the boiler was a health hazard and the fridge never kept anything cold. But it was all we could afford, so we made the best of it and I survived on instant mash, tinned tomatoes and brown sauce until I got a job. My friend helped me with that. She also did agency work for marketing companies and offered me to either join her lap dancing or the agency work. I chose the latter. I'd never had the courage to be a lap dancer, even if I did think it was a good idea. She never really took any of her clothes off anyway. She was such a good talker that I think they just paid her to be quiet most of the time. Single life was amazing. I didn't earn a lot, but it was more than I'd ever had, and I would never work in the same place for long, so I really got to explore London more. In the mornings, I could be at a train station handing out free chocolate bars or something. After that, an exhibition, and in the evening, I could be handing out free drinks in a bar. I did everything and Anything from dressing up as a banana to walking around celebrity parties handing out free stuff. I loved it and I made tons of friends. I have so many stories from that time but I'll tell you just one of them. There was a new cable channel out called The Dating Channel and me and a friend were hired to walk around a shopping centre asking people to film a profile for themselves. By the end of the job, they needed a couple more profiles, so my friend and I made one each. I didn't want to do it as myself, so I created a character called Millie with pigtails and glasses and filmed a profile. I never saw it, but apparently they played it a lot on the channel. I didn't have a TV, uh, let alone have cable, so... But later on, I found out that the Radio 1... The BBC Radio 1 breakfast show saw it and started a week-long nationwide appeal to get a date for Millie. One night, about a year later, my life was about to change again. A friend of mine invited me to a Halloween party in Brixton, so I put on my best long, tassely black dress and black buffalo trainers like the Spice Girls used to wear and went along. As I was getting ready, I just knew that I was going to meet someone that night. I remember looking into the mirror and just smiling at myself. I just, I just knew. The party was terrible. (laughs) There weren't even any nice people there, let alone nice men. But I did make friends with a DJ and he offered to take me and my friend to another party. So we went along. We didn't have any money to buy drinks. We'd run out by that time, but I was quite good at pool. So I challenged someone to a game and we won our drinks. My friend and I were dancing away when I looked over the other side of the room and I saw the most beautiful man... I had ever seen. He was sitting there looking at me with his arm over the space beside him. I played it cool and spoke to his friends first but then made my way to the empty space next to him. We talked for hours. He was dark-skinned 
and exotic looking with the kindest face, really deep eyes and the warmest of voices. His name was Nam. He was Vietnamese with a strong London accent and was a DJ. I fell in love with him straight away. I wrote my phone number down for him on the tiniest piece of paper. He managed not to lose it and called me the next day and we started dating. Nam had had a tragic upbringing. Having left the poverty of Vietnam after the war as a baby with his mum, only to end up in the poorest of homes with a physically abusive stepfather. He was living alone in his sister's old place. It was a real bachelor pad. DJ decks in the lounge, friends round all the time and it needed a really good clean. <laughs> he needed a woman in his life so I moved in and cleaned the place up. We were very close very quickly and knew that we'd one day be married and have children. We knew each other already as soon as we met. After a short time dating, we decided to get our heads down and work really, really hard just to make our lives better. After a lot of work and saving, all in one year, we bought our first place, we had our first baby and planned a wedding. So, in 2003, I became a mum to the most beautiful, sweet little girl with dark, thick hair, gorgeous olive skin and big, juicy red lips. Her name is Mia. Her birth was a really bizarre experience. It lasted all night long and by morning I was screaming at the top of my lungs in broad daylight curtains wide open looking through huge big windows at the Houses of Parliament. The hospital was directly opposite. I had no pain relief or gas in air. I'm surprised they didn't hear me in cabinet. Poor Nam didn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> Mia didn't look anything like me and people used to assume I was her childminder but... I didn't care about that. I was a proud young mum. We had a few cultural complications over the wedding plans, nothing too major. I was well accepted by his family and him by mine, but we decided that pleasing everyone else was too difficult, so we did our own thing and we got married in the mountains of northern Thailand. It was a lot cheaper to go there than it was to have a wedding at home, surprisingly enough. So we had a super budget Buddhi Buddhist wedding. We had hungry local villagers as guests, some dancing girls, a band and a drunk videographer. Neither of us speak Thai, so we didn't understand a word of what the monk was saying, but it was the most beautiful ceremony. I wore a green and gold wraparound dress with a purple orchid in my hair and Nam wore a cream Thai style linen suit. Our wedding flowers were jasmine. Afterwards we travelled to Nam's birth town in Vietnam to see his family that he'd never met. He never knew his dad because he unfortunately passed away whilst Nam was growing up in London. However, he was a well-known football player during his lifetime in Vietnam and people recognised him in the streets because of it. They were pointing at Nam saying his dad's name. It was quite an emotional trip. With a grandchild in the family, my dad decided he'd like to move to the south and be nearer to us. My younger sister had already moved down south to London for other reasons with her fiancé and 
dad was ready for another house renovation. <laughs> With me being a mum now and more settled, I think my mum found it easier to relate to me, so our relationship improved a little bit. I really enjoyed being a mum, but it was so lonely for me. I had none of my old friends anymore. They were still all busy partying away. For a whole year, the only friend I had was our elderly neighbour, Kath, who would come in every day at 2pm for tea. Kath is still around now, living in the same place. I go back there and I take care of her every couple of weeks. I take her shopping and help her with things she needs. We're very close and she's been like a mum to me. She never had any children of her own, so I'm like family to her. I began spending the weekends with my family, <clears throat> like a dutiful daughter, but it wasn't good for me at all. Those feelings I'd had that made me want to leave them came back again, and I began to feel trapped. Nan was working really hard to keep us. He was so tired and he was stressed, and I was stressed and we argued a lot. So I did what I knew best and threw myself into work, which incidentally made me unavailable at the weekends, so I didn't have to hang around with my family as much. I borrowed whatever I needed to start my own business and I became a London market trader. I drove a silver transit van with pink fluffy dice hanging in the windscreen and I sold electrical hair products. It was so much fun working alongside really lively people. They're some of the best people ever, so funny and so happy. They took me under their wing and really looked after me. The work was hard, usually starting between five and six in the morning, and we couldn't afford childcare, so I took Mia with me. I was determined to take care of her myself anyway. So she would sit on a stool in the middle of my pitch, all wrapped up with her breakfast in hand, and I would build the stool all around her. It was really tough, but we had lots of fun. She'd have her nap beside me, and then help moving boxes and selling things. Before long, I had four different market pitches, working seven days a week, and... I was a big hit with the African girls, who always needed new hair straighteners. I didn't make a huge amount of money because I kept feeling sorry for people all the time and I gave my stock away, but I did alright. It was a dream of mine and Nam's to move somewhere quieter, and with both of us working constantly, we never once took a break, no holidays, nothing. We were finally able to do that. So we sold up and moved to the same area that my mum and dad were living in. It was a nice place and we thought that it would be nice to raise Mia there. We bought the only house that was in within our budget. Nothing worked and it needed complete renovation which we couldn't afford. But it had a garden and it was ours and we were so happy to be there. Away from the city and into a more child friendly area. I remember the first year we had no heating and barely any money left over each month for food, but we loved each other deeply and it always got us through. Life was tough and we had our moments of stress just like everyone, but we were happy. Things were ticking along nicely in our old rickety house. Our finances had improved a little bit and we were saving up to pay my dad to renovate the place which he had kindly agreed to do. I couldn't leave him twiddling his thumbs, could I? He needed a new house to renovate. So we did the sensible thing and added to our financial obligations by having another child. In 2009... I became a mum again to a beautiful, kind, sweet and empathic little boy named Bo, which pronounced in Vietnamese means father. 
I had built my stall every weekend right up until I was eight months pregnant, so I managed to stay quite fit. The midwives agreed that I could have a home birth, and it was the most beautiful experience of my entire life. We hired a pool, and because we were at home, Mia could be there too, which I really, really wanted. So she was the first person he saw when he opened his eyes. She cut his cord and she helped the midwives. Nam near enough passed out from the anxiety of it all. (laughs) But us girls had it covered. It was time to say goodbye to my market days and I started working with a friend of mine on a small business. I helped Nam with his work and I got involved in the community for my children. On top of work, two children, a falling apart house to take care of, I ran the local baby group, youth club, preschool committee and I had an allotment where I grew food for us to grow my own vegetables. Between wanting to please everyone all the time and trying to prove how good I was, I became the most stressed and worn out I'd ever been in my entire life. I took on everyone's pain and responsibilities. I barely looked after myself and even all my clothes had holes in. Once again, I was the smiling, hard-working people pleaser on the outside and a total mess on the inside. Nan was tired from working all the time. I was totally overwhelmed, so again, we argued a lot. Then, one day just before Christmas, disaster struck. Finally, after saving and borrowing, we were able to renovate our house. It needed near demolition, so we couldn't stay in it. And luckily, my dad had offered for us to lodge with him till it was habitable again. The building work and the accommodation wasn't for free, of course, but we were so grateful for the work to be done and have a place to stay. I planned to be the best daughter ever. They wouldn't even know we were there. And I fell over myself to make sure that everything was going to be perfect. Housework, cooking, everything. I bought fancy presents for everyone and planned the perfect Christmas with minimum stress. I was aware that it wasn't my mum's choice that we move into her home. So I wanted to have as little impact on her life as possible and just keep everyone happy. The 17th of December that year was the most stressful day of my entire life. My mostly, it was mostly self-perpetuated, which I understand now. Uh, Work, school events, emptying our house and both of the children had flu. My work friend watched the children for a moment while I went to run an errand and whilst I was getting into my car, another car came skidding around the corner on the ice and scooped me up onto her bonnet. Suddenly everything was in slow motion and I was looking into the eyes of the driver. I felt really sorry for her first of all, because she just looked terrified. And then I had a feeling of just total surrender, like I was about to die and there was nothing I could do about it. I fell off her car bonnet and hit my head on the side of the road and blacked out. The driver was unharmed and she managed to stop her car further down the road. Due to bad weather conditions and our location, my dad's truck was a better option than the ambulance. I was in and out of consciousness but came around on the journey to the hospital.
My left tibia was crushed on impact with the car and I needed an operation to save my leg so I was admitted to hospital. They took bone from my hip to build up the tibia and I had a plate and some screws to hold it all in place. On top of that, a full leg plaster and a steady stream of morphine. A hospital stay all over the Christmas period. My life was complete, completely turned upside down, but I was really grateful to still have it. And what struck me the most about that time was all of the medical professionals kept saying, you're so young, we can do this, or you're young, so we need to make sure that uh, we do this. And it just surprised me because after my life so far, I felt like I was anything but young. <laughs> Slowly but surely after that, life became near enough unbearable. I was stuck in heavy, full-leg plaster and crutches on a bed in my mum and dad's garden shed, which they called the garden room, which luckily had a toilet and a sink. Thank goodness. And it was the middle of winter. I was in a lot of pain and unable to do very little for myself, let alone do anything for my children. They were sleeping upstairs in the house and I couldn't get up there to read them a story and say goodnight to them. It was really awful. Nam had to keep working night and day to pay for everything on his own because... I was out of work and we had to rely on others to take care of the children and pay childcare and stuff. I coordinated everything from my bed and asking other people to do things for me was the worst thing ever. My dad threw his everything into finishing that house. Working was his way of dealing with things so his way of helping was getting on with that so that we could move back in there. Mum had started off helpful and involved but I could tell that the enthusiasm was quickly running out and we began to feel unwelcome in that house. A lot happened between me and my family during this time. I was at my lowest and in need of help which allowed for people who should have been there for me to behave in ways I'd never seen before to such a degree. It wouldn't be appropriate or smart to go into details about those events at this time, mostly because it would invite negativity into my life now and in the future, which no one needs. However, I will say that emotional manipulation is one of the worst kinds of bullying to endure, especially when it's coming from the people who you should be able to rely on for love when it's needed. I don't often talk about my lack of a close relationship with the women I grew up with. For a lot of people, it's one of the worst things ever to speak disrespectfully of family, especially of the woman who brought you into this world. And in many cases, I would agree with that. And by talking about it, you also run the risk of sounding as though you're the one with the problem, especially when it's hidden narcissistic style behaviour. The type when everyone else sees a nice version of them but you. But right is right and wrong is wrong. There are bad and good people in this world and there are plenty more in between and they all have to be related to someone. So, if you're one of those people in the same situation as me, I get it. I totally get it. I'm just really glad that Nam was there. Even after his upbringing, he couldn't, beha he couldn't believe the behaviour he was seeing. And finally, I had someone on my side to see what I had always experienced. And thank goodness he was there. We finally moved back into our home. Our new, improved little house was amazing. There was still work to do when we moved in, 
and it's still not finished, but it was the loveliest place either of us had ever lived in. After two further operations to my leg, physiotherapy, exercise and determination, I was able to walk again and pick up my babies from school and nursery. The rest of the healing started to begin and as my physical health improved, my mental health needed a lot of attention. I couldn't sleep. I had regular panic attacks and was depressed and completely distracted at times. I could make the dinner from start to finish and afterwards couldn't remember a moment of it. Then the most amazing thing happened to me. I found you all. My anxiety was sky high and I would wake up at 3am, wide awake, quite often. I remembered years ago that me and my ex-boyfriend used to fall asleep each night to tapes of The Goon Show, an old BBC show from the 1950s. The foley sounds and the voices used to send me off easily, so I searched for background sounds and relaxation videos. Eventually, ASMR videos came up. Discovering the name for my tingles was incredible in so many ways. It felt as though my whole life had made sense up to that point. I found my people and I didn't feel so different anymore. I started sleeping through the night and after a while I found the clarity of mind and the courage to get help for my anxiety and was diagnosed with severe PTSD. I didn't feel sad about it at all at that time. Once I knew what it was and that it wasn't my fault, after a course of CBT with the most amazing therapist, my symptoms near enough went away. I still have the odd symptom now, but I'm so much more self-aware and I know how to manage myself. If it wasn't for being run over by a car and everything that happened since, I would never have learned self-care and the importance of that. I'd been pushed to such a point with my family that I couldn't be in their presence anymore without starting a panic attack, which meant I had to minimise contact and that really helped a lot. About six months later, I started making a few ASMR videos of my own to make friends and to be more involved in the community. Aside from being a mum and from meeting them, this has to be hands down the best thing that ever happened to me. Life became really fun after that. Nam and I started making more time for socialising and our group of friends grew. We had so many good times and we met families with similar age children. It was nice to do our own thing and to put all of the stress behind us. Finally, it was good to have the space to heal. However, it wasn't meant to last. <laughs> We must have had a few more life lessons to learn because there was much more drama on the way and what I'm about to say isn't the last of it either so 
thank you for listening this far. Here goes. I ended up in an impossible situation and one that I wouldn't wish on anyone and it's the most difficult thing I've ever had to deal with even after everything I've just said. There was a family in our social group that stood out to everyone else and not for good reasons. Each other family seemed to have something they weren't comfortable with, some little things, some pretty worrying, but no one dared assume the worst. The children from different families started reporting events back to their parents and things that had made them uncomfortable and unfortunately our son had an experience we had to act on. There's a heck of a lot to this story, lots of events that there would be no point going into now but suffice to say that after taking advice from someone qualified and a lot of soul searching I made a report to the authorities. I'll never forget how terrifying the phone call was, but they assured me it was serious and they needed to investigate. The investigation was a complete farce. The parents were alerted to the report, but nothing more was done for over a month, and due to staff shortages, they only looked into it for the minimum amount. Apparently, that's quite a common occurrence for cases in rural areas and it's such a massive shame. This made the situation worse and when the parents discovered that it was me that made the call, they went on the attack. They tried everything they could to deflect back onto me using people in the community, making up stories about me, telling lies, Thankfully, after all the work I'd done for the children's groups and other community projects, lots of people knew me and knew me to be quite the opposite to the person they were describing, so the plan didn't work so well. However, the mother threatened my life, which was really scary. She also called my close friends and threatened various levels of violence towards me. The father would stand and stare at my children in the school playground and block my way on the pavement outside school. They are wealthy, you see, and they're close friends with a lawyer who tried to intimidate me at a community event. All of this stuff was reported, and don't worry, I am safe now, but it was a difficult time for sure. Since then, another separate incident, nothing to do with me, someone else apparently, another incident happened and another report was made. I can't finish with a conclusion to the matter, but as far as I know, it's still ongoing. However, I will say, and this is the purpose of me telling this story, that if anyone any of you are ever in the same position, if you ever witness something you know isn't right. Child protection is the number one priority and incidents like these should never be ignored. But please, please don't forget how important your protection is too. Always make sure you're safe and that you have support by your side because you will need it. So throughout all of this time, I was making my ASMR videos. The strength and the relaxation I got from that was immense. Spending time with you all was an escape from the stress for me and thank goodness for it. I didn't tell many of my friends about the channel and certainly not family. I think when you're so used to not talking to people about the tingles, it didn't seem like something I needed to mention. And it was just my little hobby anyway. However, I thought I'd start to mention it to my friends. My channel was growing a bit and I was just really proud of it. A close friend at that time had just relocated her family to LA and I missed her so much. There have been so many stressful events in my life and we hadn't been on holiday since Nam and I got married so 
I decided that we'd go. Poor Nem had to stay behind and work. But he said go ahead and enjoy yourselves. I really needed a break and it was an exciting opportunity for the children. I decided to tell my friend about my channel when we got there. It was so great seeing her. The children really missed each other too and LA was fantastic. Just hanging around, doing normal stuff, taking the kids to school, shopping, driving around. We had a trip to Disney as well. It was brilliant. Everything was going so well until I told her about my channel and I also told her that I wanted to take a day out to go and meet another content creator. She tried to understand about ASMR but had a really hard time and the rest of the trip was so tricky. I tried to keep the energy up but we were just not welcome at all after that. I couldn't wait to get back on that plane and go home to Nam. She and I spoke afterwards and apparently she thought it was narcissistic of me to put myself on YouTube. She said it was sad and I must be missing something in my home life to want to do something like ASMR. It was such a big kick in the teeth for me and I was absolutely devastated. Mostly because I couldn't believe that I had continued for so long to allow such awful people into my life. I love everyone despite their faults but I was learning then that there needs to be a limit and I had to stop allowing people to hurt me. From that moment on, I did a complete evaluation of everyone in my life. I studied everything I could find out about narcissists and sociopaths and became much more aware of what personality type I am and why I behaved the way I did for so long. I realised that I had been a victim of my extroverted, highly sensitive personality through sheer lack of understanding self-love and confidence. I vowed then to turn it into an advantage from now on. I now have the most wonderful, very small group of friends close by, people who have been there through all of it and they know me inside out. And then there's you guys. Some of you I have met, some of you I know of and many that I don't but I know that you're there and I know you're listening and I know that you feel and that's so important and it just means the world. I have one more story to tell, uh, one I have promised a few times before but it's just never been the right time. Um, but now you know my past. I believe it is the right time and now you'll be able to understand it all and I, I am able to explain it properly. So this is a story of what happened to my wedding ring and my engagement ring. After the big storm that had been mine and Nam's life for so long, there was suddenly calm. The odd ripple here and there but nothing we couldn't handle. Um, Nam and I had been through so much together and we worked so hard. We put ourselves through a lot over the years and we'd been very hard on ourselves. We went over and above what was necessary at times too and we attracted heartache into our lives and ultimately our day-to-day -day relationship. There was a lot we had come up against as a couple and we got into the habit of acting out our frustrations on each other. Me quietly building resentment from unresolved disagreements and him reacting to all of the pressures we'd had around us. Impatient and resisting what is became his default and I always knew he hadn't processed his past, not fully. 
My life had changed incredibly. I went through a lot of personal growth. I'd had therapy. I learned a lot and my eyes were just wide open. Nam and I had finally achieved what we set out to all of those years ago. We had somewhere nice to raise our children. We had um, an albeit modest but steady income with which to do it. Two absolutely beautiful children, the most loving of friends. And we were still not happy, not in a day-to-day sense. We'd always said things will be better when this happens or things will be better when we have this or when we have that. Um, But when was now and everything was the same, just prettier looking and we had kitchen cupboards and a boiler that worked. (laughs) Finally, we agreed to separate. Um, There were a lot of frustrations and heated discussions, of course, uh, but we knew it was the right thing to do. Um, We were all sad, the children included. They were involved in the discussions as well, and it was important for us to listen to them and um, keep them just involved in what was happening so that they didn't feel like they were left out and that they weren't in control at all. We took our wedding rings off and Nam moved out of our home. I had Mia and Bo during the week and he had them at the weekends, which is when I filmed my videos. And I have to say that as sad as it all was and how hard it was being poor again, though I'm quite good at being poor, (laughs) and how lonely I was at times, I couldn't remember ever feeling so much peace and calm. The children flourished in the atmosphere and at the weekends they had a lot of fun with their dad. He's never spent that much time with them on his own before and he bonded with them in a way that he'd never had the time or the patience to. He'd always been a really loving dad and he always really loved and adored his children, children, but all of their practical care had previously been my job. So suddenly he had to know their timetables, their homework, what was going on with their friends, everything. I became the most centred I'd ever been in my life and with the love and support from you guys who never knew anything other than that I had removed my rings. I just couldn't be anything but strong. I was finally taking care of myself and it just felt really good. It was touch and go for a while, but Nam eventually took control and he pulled through. He never missed childcare payments we'd agreed to. He always kept his word with the childcare arrangements and got himself into therapy, which was so important. In fact, the same lady who treated my PTSD, he went to see her. Her name is Lorraine and she's our saviour. She's an amazing woman. He also gave me the space I needed, which was just right. I did yoga every day, I lost weight, started studying sound therapy and Reiki. There were even more hours in the day, it was just amazing. I was on top of everything at home, it was lovely. After therapy, lots of time, patience, healing and growth. Nam completely turned everything around and we started to fall in love again. Just like we did when we first met, but with much more understanding and maturity. It felt like we had pressed the reset button and we could build a relationship that we both wanted through everything we had learnt. We got to show our children that if things aren't right, then you fix them and how to do that properly. Eventually, after lots of dates, on our own and with the children, having fun together and being a team, Nam moved back into our little house and we became the best family we could be. Mia and Bo are really proud of us for making things better. Everyone is respected and we purposefully show kindness to each other. 
nothing and no one is perfect and we still have the odd disagreements but nothing big nothing big at all and now we have a way through um, with love and patience we just come to a compromise and we could never do that before we were just so busy and focused on other things that we just weren't doing things right above all now neither of us want to have the same experience as we did before and we'll never again allow outside influences to affect our day-to-day -day happiness as a couple and a family I'm the love and support he's never had from anyone in his entire life and he's my protector and he's my home we saved each other when we met and we've been taking care of each other ever since, even when we were apart. Nam has always supported me in anything I want to do and he thinks you're all really wonderful. He enjoys it when I read the comments to him, all the nice things that you say. I sit and read them to him quite often and he has a really big heart and he appreciates all of them. Some of you have said in the past that they'd be quite spooked stepping out of the tingle shed at night after filming. <laughs> well, I'm not too keen on the dark either, so he waits for me to finish recording and he helps me back into the house. Just so you know. <laughs> he doesn't get tingles and sometimes tries to give me ideas for videos. Um, he's, getting <laughs> he's getting a bit better at that. <laughs> But, um, yeah, <laughs> some of his ideas are quite funny. Mia doesn't feel tingles either, um, but Bo does, and he loves me to stroke his hair to sleep, and he loves me to draw on his back. So I do that for him quite often. So I'll finish this rather long video now, and tell you a few things I can see in the future just to finish off on a super positive note and I feel like if I say it here then it's definitely going to happen okay I'm going to continue to show anyone and everyone how wonderful ASMR is I've experienced people in my local area uh, gossiping about my YouTube channel I think I may have spoken about this before They've said all kinds of different things. Um, one woman even came up to me and said that she's been watching my porn channel. And I've been told that people have passed my videos around the local pub. You name it, I've seen it. But you know what? I don't care about that stuff one bit. Those people just make me more determined to keep going and... My mission is to make it so that no one ever feels embarrassed to talk about their love for tingles or for ASMR videos to family and friends. I will continue to make videos until you guys tell me it's time to stop. Then, my dream is to build an ASMR residential retreat centre. I want to find a beautiful green space and have Mongolian yurts for accommodation, a community space, therapy rooms and a vegan cafe. And with the proceeds from that, I would like to fund a project to rescue children from the streets and to give them a home, education and lots of love. So I hope to set up a foundation for that. I know it's going to happen and I know that when the time comes you guys will be supportive and I'm so excited about that. I expect I'm about halfway through my life now. Everything I believe up to this point has been to teach me how to live the next half and I intend to do it consciously. So thank you so so much from the bottom of my heart for everything and there isn't really much for me to say now apart from sweet dreams <laughs>